Ave Maria. At that time, Jesus, having come into the district of Caesarea Philippi, began to ask his disciples, saying, Who do men say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Then Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I say to you, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. For us as Catholics, this passage of Scripture is perhaps the best known. It gives us a certain confidence in the Church. But in the current time in which we live, we may be tempted to forget it, or at least not use it as we ought to strengthen our faith. Our Lord said to Simon Peter, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. And in her 2,000 years of history, we have seen this again and again. The problem is that at any particular point in the history of the church, the faithful of the time are always threatened by doubt, by uncertainty. Will the Lord fulfill his promise? And of course, he has, throughout these years, fulfilled his promise. And even in these current days of uncertainty, these current days of distress, we must remain convinced that he will be faithful to his promise. We think of the very first days of the church when Simon Peter was arrested, imprisoned. What did the church do? We're told they sent up prayers, begging God to intercede. And the Lord did. An angel came and freed him from prison. Again, he was arrested. And as we know, he was taken to Rome. Um, He was in Rome and he was crucified upside down. But what did the apostle say long before this? In the first letter, he says to us, but the God of all grace who has called us into his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, will himself, after we have suffered a little while, perfect, strengthen, and establish us. After we have suffered a little while. So we need to understand that suffering is part and parcel of the Christian life, and certainly part and parcel of the apostolic life. The church went through many persecutions for some 300 years, and St. Callistus, whose feast we, we celebrate today, was also one of the victims, the sacrificial victims of the church. In fact, the first 50 popes were all martyrs. But the gates of hell would not surrender, they would not give up. And they won't until the final judgment. The gates of hell had attacked the church externally in the persecutions, and those failed. And then came the internal persecutions, 
and just the highlights we, found, we find in the 9th, 10th centuries where the church, where the pontiffs, the popes, were literally captives of the powerful families of the time. And the papacy was a football to be kicked between one and the other and all the consequent corruption that came from this. We have popes in that period of whom we are ashamed, not only as pontiffs, but even, and perhaps above all, as Christians, and even as men, for the wicked things that were done. Yet, in due time, the church appealing to God, God raised up reforming popes, and among them, of course, we have the great Hildebrand, Gregory VII, who himself suffered, again, as St. Peter had said, he suffered for a little while. But these reforming popes brought some hope, and above all, they brought reform. Then we again have a period of, of, of rest, but for a short time. Again, the persecutions began, this time by the princes, who had again attempted to use the papacy as a football to be shared among them. We have the captivity in Avignon of the popes. We, again, God raises up saints at that time. And so we come to perhaps another disgraceful period after the, the Black Death and the other horrors that struck Europe. We have the popes of the Renaissance. And again, they were worldly men, not worthy of the high office to which they had been called. But the consequent, and the consequences of this were the, the breaking up of Christendom, where nearly half the church abandoned, half the, the faithful abandoned the church. But even while Europe was split um, by Martin Luther, we have on the other side of the world the Lord intervening and the similar number entered the church in the new world. Then comes another period of reform and we have again popes coming out of this such as Paul IV and St. Pius V, reforming popes. And then for a period we have some semblance of what the, 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 the church, the body of Christ, should be. But again, the problems arise because, as we, as we heard, the gates of hell will always be a threat to the integrity of the church, of the faith, of the faithful. And then we come to the 18th century, and we have the, the, what is called the Enlightenment. And Voltaire, in particular, would say, destroy this wretched thing, referring to the church. And that call would be taken up by the revolutionaries in France. And there would be the, a great divide and, and the war, which would lead, again, to the imprisonment of the Pope, Pius the, the VI. He died in captivity, but he remained firm and held fast to the, the authority that had been given to him by Christ. I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. At that point, the revolution said, the last pope is dead. This is the end of the church. But in Venice, a conclave elected Pius VII. And again, the struggle begins. Napoleon himself arrests Pius, and in the famous um, interview with Consalvi, by and Napoleon and Consalvi, the Cardinal Consalvi, the Emperor says, "Don't you know I have power to destroy your church?" And Consalvi laughed at him and said, "Your Majesty." We priests have been trying to do that for 1,800 years, and we have not failed. We have, or, and we have not failed. We have not. We failed to destroy it. You will not succeed. 
of course, within a few years, Napoleon was gone. And then we come again to this period in 1884 under Leo XIII, where the, the voice calls out boastfully, give me Paul, give me more power over your priests, and I will destroy your church within a hundred years. The gates of hell do not give up. And we again have seen what the power of hell can do, even in our time. And so when we see the, the hierarchy, the episcopacy, the popes, the bishops, all in confusion, when we no longer have that clear teaching, we may be tempted to despair, but we should not. Even now, we can be certain that God is, in fact, raising up saints to restore the church, to purify the episcopacy and the, the, the priesthood. We can be certain of that. God will not abandon his church. Our Lord has given us a promise. He's built it on a rock. And no matter what the gates of hell do, it will never overcome the church founded by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to whom be honor and glory forever and ever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Santa Maria Mater Dei.